<laughs> hmm? Granddad never mentioned that there were men as dark as this. Wow, look at that nose. He's just like a pig. He's a monster! Hi! In today's episode, I'm joined by Shino Tanikawa. You're a school integration advocate who wrote the article, I Fight for Integrated Schools in New York City. I'm also Asian American, Mayor de Blasio, Let's Talk. Thank you for joining me today. If you want to introduce yourself, um, go ahead. Sure. So my name is Shino Tanikawa, and I'm a parent with uh, two daughters. One went through the public school system in New York City, and the other one is a senior in high school in New York City Public School. Okay. And I have been working on school integration issues for the last, oh, maybe five years or so. Can you elaborate on that? Like, what have you done to fight for racial justice? I have, um, so I serve on the Community Education Council District 2, which is sort of an equivalent to a local school board for Community School District 2, which is um, southern half of Manhattan. Through that school board work, I have um, convened meetings with parents to talk about equity issues in public schools, what do schools look like in terms of student enrollment? What do the teachers look like? And why do we have these opportunity gaps between different schools? And what can we do to address those inequities in the system? So it's been a series of conversations with parent leaders and educators, that's teachers and administrators. And more recently, I have served on the School Diversity Advisory Group, which is a group convened by the mayor's office, but we've operated independently of the mayor's office to develop a set of recommendations for school integration for New York City public schools. Okay. Um, can you move your camera down? Because like your head was cut sorry. off. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> That's much yeah. better. Um, okay. So um, how has your fight for racial justice helped uh, this conversation or like help uh, integrate schools? So the racial justice works has helped in terms of seeing, first of all, acknowledging and seeing my own privilege in this system as an East Asian woman um, with resources and a graduate degree, I've had to come to terms with my own privilege and what it meant for me and my own children and how my own children have gotten a lot of extras and educational enrichment because of their privilege and my privilege. So I think understanding that privilege was important for me to realize that different people have different levels of privilege and some people have very little and that's where the racial justice work has helped me understand those inequities also being east asian has been a very challenging but interesting perspective because we don't fit into the more conventional I don't want to say straightforward, but binary way of thinking about racial justice, which is usually white versus black and brown. But we don't fit into that binary mode. We do have privilege as I have privilege, at least as East Asians. But I have also been um, experienced oppression based on my race. So I personally have oscillated between this oppressor role and the being oppressed role. And it's been a very complicated and challenging place to be in because there is no clear narrative for me as an East Asian. So it's like a wedge. Absolutely is, yes. Especially if you start to learn about the history of Asian in this country. You know, I now understand fully how this myth of model minority was created as the result of the Cold War, as the aftermath of the World War II, and what the U.S. was trying to do to dominate the world, and all that rich history, and how we were placed in the middle of that as a wedge between not only just the white and the black people in this country, but also between the U.S. and the rest of the world. Um, so that kind of gets into my point of like the, this idea of a wedge, um, because it seems as though 
that wedge is being used to divide communities of color, particularly on the specialized high school admissions test. And I wanted to yeah. ask, uh, what are your thoughts on getting rid of the test? I am actually in favor of getting rid of the test. I'm not a big test person, partially because I'm not the best test taker to start with. I've also noticed that some of the most intelligent people that I have known in my life are not good test takers. And also to gauge somebody's knowledge and expertise on one standardized test in your life, it just intuitively, it doesn't make sense to me. So I am in favor of eliminating any test-based admissions. And when I say test-based admissions, it means determining somebody's future based on one single test taken on one day in your life. I am firmly against that. Um, to elaborate, um, the, the proposal that the Blasio had was to grant admission to the top 7% of students in each city's mi middle school. That was basically the idea. Um, and you mentioned in your article that you were concerned about how the proposal will, um, didn't include talking to people who it may affect. Um, what was it about how de Blasio went about the proposal that was an issue for you? He didn't talk to anybody, period. I mean, that's really the bottom line. He did not consult with parent leaders. He didn't consult with principals. He didn't consult with teachers. He didn't consult with the Asian communities, which make up 65% of the student population in the specialized high schools. He didn't consult with the black leaders, the Latinx leaders, nobody. He and his group of small group of people, I don't even know who they were, came up with this proposal and rolled it out. And that's just not the way to do it. And we had the school diversity advisory group operating and meeting on a regular basis when the mayor rolled out this plan. He didn't even consult with this entity that was developing recommendations on this issue. So I don't know what he was thinking or why he did it the way he did, but it was doomed. It, it was just, you know, from the start, it was not going to succeed. Okay. And do you think that if the proposal was handled in a way that included all the people involved that the Asian community would have rallied behind it? I think some people within the Asian communities may have gotten behind it if they understood better what the proposal was intended to do and if the proposal had measures to address their needs. So with the merit of the proposal aside, the fact remains, if the specialized high schools are serving a lot of Asian students, and if we move forward with the mayor's proposal, which by the way, is not happening. But yep. if we did, that does mean that a lot of Asian students are not going to end up in the specialized high schools. That's just simple math. But that also does not mean that these students are going to be robbed of their educational opportunities because there are other schools that are not part of the specialized high schools in the city that can give them equal or better opportunities. So one of the issues that I've learned after the proposal came up by talking to community leaders in Asian communities is that specialized high schools are seen as their way out of poverty or their pathway to success. But because of the complexity of the admission system in New York City high schools and lack of adequate outreach and lack of accessibility of the information, a lot of Asian immigrant families rely on existing social networking to get the information on where to apply and how to apply. So I think a lot of families from the Chinese community use things like WeChat to get the information they need to go through the process. But the information that is circulated on some of the social media platform is limited. 
So you don't necessarily find out about other good schools in the New York City school system that can meet their kids' needs without spending a lot of money on test prep because they are, they are out there. So without that kind of targeted outreach to the population who will be most affected by the proposal, it's not a good proposal because you're essentially asking a, a segment of the student population to give up their seats in order for this integrated schools to work, but they shouldn't have to give up seats if they are given information about other available school seats in the system. Okay. Um, had you heard of any concerns within the Asian community about the lack of black and Latino students in these schools prior to de Blasio's proposal? No, not that I know of. Yeah. But I think there are students out there. I mean, I've met some people after the proposal came out and some East Asian former students, graduates of these schools, have said that it, it was a problem not to have a diverse school. So I think those students are out there. Um, I want to get into like how the test works for it in a second, but I have a couple more questions. Um, what are your thoughts on the Asian Americans who oppose the plan altogether and want to keep it as is? Do you understand their perspective? or? I do understand their perspective to a degree. I know that culturally, I was born and raised in Japan, so this notion of meritocracy and the test being a subjective or objective, sorry, the test being an objective, um, fair measure is something that I think a lot of people believe in. But on the other hand, I think we have to understand that this country is rooted and founded on racism and genocide, that there is no such thing as meritocracy in the United States of America. And if we don't understand that there is no meritocracy because the, the playing field is not level, that people of color are being oppressed, even today, even in the public school system, even for these Asian students who are getting higher test scores on standardized tests, we are still an oppressed people in the system. If we don't understand that the playing field is not level, then I think we're not doing ourselves any favors by believing that meritocracy exists. So I understand where they're coming from. I understand that this is the pathway to success and a better future, but I don't want them to believe in that because I don't think, I think it's a false dream. The, I've heard some things on the opposition, on the opposition. I don't know if you heard of Fareed Zakaria. He's a Indian American that uh, talks on CNN. He's a political commentator. There's dog whistling that I wanted to point out that kind of bothers me. This is what he said about the tests. But to complain that the schools have a diversity problem as the mayor does is wrong and wrong headed. First, these schools are incredibly diverse. The category called Asians actually encompasses people who trace their, that trace their ancestry to China, South Korea, Vietnam, India, Bangladesh, Indonesia, the Philippines, among others. Wildly different countries and cultures. Perhaps more important, the test is designed to find talented students not to raise up specific minorities, which the rest of the vast New York school system works hard to do. That, to me, I think that's what this conversation has kind of turned into, this sense of like dog whistling that kind of says certain things about certain minorities that may lead to other conclusions. I don't know if that's something that you've heard or what your thoughts about that are, but... Yeah, I've heard it. But to me, school integration work personally speaking, is about dismantling racism. And when I say diversity in school integration, I'm talking about every school in New York City looking like the entire system, right? And the entire system of public schools in New York City is 40% Latino, about 30% Black, and then 15% White, 15% Asian. That's the diversity we're not talking about diversity when we have, I mean, it, it's true that the use of the label Asian American is highly problematic. And that is something that many of us are working to change because to lump more than four dozen countries and, and cultures into one label is problematic because 
Asians are incredibly diverse. So the statement like that is not wrong, but if we don't include Black and Latinx people in this conversation, in the conversation about school in integration, then I don't think we're doing any favors to anybody. Okay. Because in the end, I'm sorry, I have to plug my phone in. It's um, The battery is about to die, which oh. is why the camera might be going. And I just lost my... Okay, just bear with me for a sec. So, one of the things that um, I'm learning is how the whole notion of Asian Americans came about during the civil rights movement, right? We were right alongside the Black and Latinx people fighting for our civil rights. And this, to me, is the same thing on the school integration issue. We need to be allied with the Black and Latinx people to make school integration happen. And we shouldn't be playing the role of the wedge because in the end, I think playing into this wedge role is going to hurt us. I wanted to talk about the test itself. Are you, are you aware as to how the test works or have you taken the test? No, my kids were not interested. So okay. I've actually never even looked at the, t I mean, I've looked at the sample test once or twice and I said, I will not be able to get into a specialized high school. Um, I, I, I've looked into the test. I see some flaws in it. I wanted to point these out. Just uh -huh. for the sake of pointing out. So the Princeton Review says that before 2017, the test uh -huh. consisted of 45 questions in the verbal, 50 questions in the math section. Now it has 57 English language arts set questions and 57 math questions, 10 of which aren't calculated in the score. So you're doing 47 really, but you don't know right. what 10. So my issue, my first issue is that where's social studies? Where's science? Where's second language? You know, you're taking those courses in middle school. You're going to take those courses at those specialized high schools. But you're yep. only looking at certain categories to determine whether or not somebody's going to get at this particular school. That doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. Um, that, that's the first part. Um, mm -hmm. The second one is regarding the cutoff scores. From what I can tell, um, it seems as though students across the city compete against each other uh, right. for this. Now, right. the problem with that is that you have schools across the city, schools in Staten Island, schools in Manhattan, schools in the Bronx. Why are eighth grade students who are trying to get into Stuyvesant competing with students that are trying to get into Staten Island Tech? That doesn't, you know. Well, I mean? that's right. So let me address that. My understanding is that that's not really how it works. Okay. So you're still matched to the school that you rank if you qualify. So within the specialized high schools, you're supposed to put down which specialized high school you're interested in attending on your application. Yeah. And if you make the cutoff, then you'll be matched to that school. So let's say I put down Stuyvesant, um, and I think you can actually rank the schools. But let's say I put down Stuyvesant, and then Staten Island Tech as the second choice. I don't make the cut for the Stuyvesant school test score, but I made the cut for uh, Staten Island Tech, then I can be offered a Staten Island Tech seat. Yeah. So yes, you're competing against other students from the city, but only against those who put down your specialized high school as your top priority school. And as far as I know, if you make the cutoff, then you get in. So you're not really competing against other students. You're competing against the test. That's my understanding. This is the part that I am confused about. Uh, about, But when I when it was on a missionsquad.org when it said that it's a citywide competition and I saw the cutoff scores. I think Stuyvesant was 560. Um, and then they showed the rest. Like It just seemed to me if everybody's taking a very similar test or the same test, and they're saying it's a citywide competition, the scores fluctuate each year. Yes, it does. Yeah. Then yeah. it's like dependent on how well certain students do and other students in different parts of the city who want to go to different schools are competing right. against them. But if that's not the case, I don't want to put that misinformation out there, but 
I wasn't too sure about that, but it just seems to me like that might be happening. And I did want to point that out. Right. Um, the scores may be normed because I know that the cutoff changes every year. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay. And the final part, which I definitely, okay. yeah, sorry. Yeah. Well, I just want to address the first part of your question about yeah. how it's only ELA and math and no yeah, yeah. sciences, right? So that's a whole argument that actually is applied to the current debate over gifted and talented education, because many school integration advocates believe that you can't measure somebody's giftedness by just offering a standardized test in ELA and math. What if somebody's a phenomenal scientist or social studies scholar? Those things aren't measured as it is right now by those tests. So I agree that I, I think it's problematic to be limiting the test to only two subjects. Yeah, that part I don't understand at all. If you're going to talk about keeping the tests, yeah. why focus on, why, why, why even put, why just have a math test? Like it just doesn't, right. you know, it doesn't make any yeah. sense. Um, yeah, I agree. And the last part, this part I'm, I'm pretty sure is, uh, has some merit. Um, I mean, look, I looked at the 2018-2019 SHSAT handbook. This is what it says. Starting from the highest score on down, each student in turn is placed in that student's highest listed school in which seats are still available. The way I look at that, you, if you don't know how the rankings work and how the cutoff scores work, let's say you live in Crown Heights and you decide to put Brooklyn Tech first and mm -hmm. you score a 570 and this cutoff score is 560 for Stuyvesant. You, put, you go to Brooklyn Tech, but if you put Stuyvesant first, you go to Stuyvesant. So you go into two different schools, not based off of how well you did on the test, but how you rank the schools. No, yeah. I think you're placed into your top ranking sco school if yeah. you meet the criteria for that. That's my understanding. So in that case, you're going to end up at Brooklyn Tech, even if you qualify for Stuyvesant. Yeah, that's my point. That, that's, right. that's the problem that I, that I see, is that if you don't know how the schools are ranked, and you put a lower ranking school first, and you, you do really well on the test, enough to get into Stuyvesant, because it's the highest listed school in which um, the highest score on down each student in turn is placed in that st student's highest listed school in which seats are still available, you're going to be prioritized to go to Brooklyn Tech because you scored really high and they're looking for all the higher cutoff people, the high scoring people, and that eliminates you from going to Stuyvesant, but you put it second. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, except that's where... Now, this is sort of a problem, not just with a specialized high school, but with the general high school admissions process as well, which for the specialized, it's a little bit more complicated because it is test score based. But if you think you have a chance of scoring high on the test, you really should rank the school in order of your preference, right? If you studied hard and if you did test prep and if you think you can actually score high enough to go to Stuyvesant and you really want to go to Stuyvesant, then you should list Stuyvesant as your number one school. Yeah. But if you are listing Brooklyn Tech as your number one school, because that's the school you prefer to go to, then you should be matched to Brooklyn Tech regardless of how, what your test score is. I mean, that policy is rooted in respecting students rank choice yeah no i i understand that i'm just worried like if you don't know that that's how the system works take for example like stuyvesant's cutoff is 560 for this year you only right. put stuyvesant because that's your that's the dream school that's it but you mm -hmm. get a 530 that's good enough to get into brooklyn tech because the cutoff was 498 but because you didn't put brooklyn right. tech anywhere you don't get into anything right like, those right. are the things that i see is like it's not about even asians outperforming blacks or hispanics or, or whatnot mm -hmm. or whites mm -hmm. it's just a matter of knowing how the system works like you have to rank it yep. your best way to get into any specialized high school is to rank it in a certain way and if yep. you don't do it in a certain way then you eliminate yourself essentially from um certain schools yes that's, and that's that's true for the entire system not just the specialized high school oh okay it's not just yeah for the, okay. it's not just specialized high school it is true for the entire new york city public education system well then that's a if if you don't understand how the system works by having a really good guidance counselor who can explain this to you, then you're not optimizing your chance. 
then that's just a and problem. That, yeah. Sorry, it's a problem, yes. But this is the flip side of having a choice program for admissions. Right. New York City has what's called the choice process for both middle school and high school. That means you're not going to your neighborhood high school based on your residential address. It means you get to choose to apply to schools that you like. There's no guarantee you'll get into your choices, but you are actually ranking schools that you like in order of preference. And you're matched to, if you're lucky, one of the schools that you list on your application. It doesn't matter how the school admits you, as long as the onus is on the families to rank and choose schools, it will give advantage to families who have the resources to research schools, to understand the system, to fully optimize your chance of getting in over families who don't have the resources to go through the process properly or have the adequate information source or access to information to guide them through. So this is the byproduct of having a choice system where parents have to express their desires for which schools they want their kids to go to. Okay. I mean, it's, the, sorry. sorry. The, the, the solution is sort of a pie in the sky solution, but if we can eliminate housing segregation and create integrated neighborhoods everywhere, then you can actually have high schools that have catchment zones. And if you live in this catchment zone, this is your high school. You don't have to do anything. But that's, right, housing desegregation is not happening anytime soon. It seems to be actually getting worse. So these are the trade-offs we have. And that, that's also a problem, like how certain people live in certain neighborhoods and maybe harder to get to certain schools compared to other people. And like they have a larger commute, a longer commute, which plays into certain disadvantages. It is, I Absolutely. mean, it's a yep. it's a complex issue, and I think that the test is while well, one part of it um, is just the beginning of the issue. Um, but there's only so much you can do in a in a certain time frame. Um, one thing I did want to mention though is uh, this conversation, and I want to point this out only can talks about minorities. So like. Donald Trump's son, Barron, went to Columbia Grammar and Grammar Preparatory School, and then he transferred to St. Andrew's Episcopal School in Washington, D.C. Both are private, both are majority white. And Bill de Blasio, regardless of how he's going about his proposal, he can't target those schools because if they're not, they're private. So regardless of however we go about doing this, the private majority white schools are going to stay private and majority white, um, which is the real problem. It's part of the problem, yes, except I think that some of the private schools are trying to at least address diversity, and some of them are actually engaged in anti-racism work head on. So I think some private schools are actually maybe doing more than we think. Their student student population may not be as diverse, but at least conversations about race and racism is starting to happen in some of the private school spaces. So that's important to recognize. Yeah. I just, I feel like, I feel like what I'm, I guess what I'm getting at is that it's a conversation in which wealthy white people remove themselves from the equation. Um, this whole idea of diversity in, in school systems, because like schools like that are still majority white and they're very expensive. Um, and they're not mm-hmm. included in the Blasio proposal because they can't be. Um, right. So, right. I wanted to point that out. Um, the last subject I wanted to talk about was the discovery program. Are you aware of what that program is? I am, but I'm not as well versed in it um, in concept. And I think in practice as well, as far as I heard, I'm in support of that program. Okay. Um, do you feel comfortable um, asking, discussing that? or? Um, I mean, I, my knowledge of the discovery program is very superficial. Okay. To the extent you know that that the students who are just below the cutoff are giving um, some supports over the summer, and they end up in their specialized high schools. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a good program, but again, I'm not a believer in the test to start with. So to me, that's sort of a band aid. Yeah. 
And the problem with that, I, I, the reason I bring that up is because um, it's not really changing the demographics of the schools. Um, right. And yeah, I'll just I'll just read the quote. Um, uh, it's from an article from U.S. U.S. News. In an effort to increase the diversity at specialized high schools, the city operates what's known as a discovery program, where low-income students who score high on the admissions tests but below the required cutoff can complete a summer program, like you mentioned, administered by the specialized high schools in order to gain admission. Spots were offered based on availability, and fewer than six percent of seats were awarded that way for the 2018-2019 school year. Um, and it's made virtually no impact on the racial makeup of the student body despite growing pro the program in recent years. De Blasio has long called for the specialized high schools to better reflect the city's student population, and in one of his first major bids to do that, announced a plan to overhaul the discovery program. The new plan requires 20% of each specialized high school's incoming class to come from the discovery program, an expansion that would come over the course of two years. The program would also be limited to certain middle schools where 60% or more of its students are poor. The plaintiffs in the lawsuit say that many schools with large Asian American student populations fall just below that 60% cutoff, um, and the new plan would render that students ineligible for that program despite the fact that many of them are poor. As it stands, it's the 2017, 67% of students admitted to the discovery program were Asians. Now it's 64, 2018, and another article it says that. But my point is that it's a program that's supposed to target essentially black and Hispanic people. And it not only is a small percentage, it was 6%, it doesn't really do that because it's majority Asian. And now that the Blazer tried to expand that to 20%, there's a lawsuit from Asians uh -huh, uh -huh. to try and keep it the way it is because they feel like it discriminates against Asian Americans. But it's not really supposed to serve them, anyways. Um, I first want, before I say anything, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. I do think, again, he did this proposal without consulting with the communities that are going to be affected, right? Yeah. So instead of only making it available to schools that have more than 60%, um, students living in poverty, why not offer it to any students living in poverty? He didn't do that. And I think that is problematic because we do have schools that have just below the poverty cutoff of 60% of students living in poverty or even 40%. And those students won't have an opportunity for this it just seems wrong. Why limit it to 60% or more students? Or if he really wants to do it right, then he has to come up with a way to help the Asian students who may not have a better, who, who may be, whose chances of getting into these specialized high schools will be slightly reduced or compromised because of these programs. And I think he needs to address those students' need as well. But he didn't. He's only focused on the Black and Latinx students and not and, and, and ignoring Asian students' needs, which actually is deeply offensive to us because we are usually completely ignored. Right? I mean, that's the oppression against most common form of oppression against Asian people is that we don't exist. We don't belong. We are the others. We don't matter. We don't have any needs. And this is just yet another example. In order to serve the Black and Latinx students better, and I'm in support of that, but the mayor just forgot to pay attention to Asian students. He didn't even think about us. And that's offensive to me because we do have needs. We do have a large number of Asian students living in poverty. They might score high on standardized tests, but that doesn't mean they don't have needs. So for him not to think about what the impact of these programs might be on Asian students, many of whom are living in poverty, is offensive. I understand that, but I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is that if there's a other side that's against getting rid of the tests, and then there are people like a lesser program, which is a discovery program, which keeps the tests, but considers 
people who just missed the cutoff score, the Asians are, it's supposed to serve the people who represent, in some cases, less than 1% of the student body, like at Stuyvesant. Um, I think Stuyvesant is like seven black students, but, um, right. like, he's trying to target that, and the Asians are taking most of those spots, so he says, okay, we can't do the tests, we can't do the discovery program as it is, so how about we target it th this way, and now they're suing the city. It's almost as if, in some cases, not every Asian, but in some cases, it's just a matter of mine, my school. Like, I'm just going to take it, and, like, I don't want to consider the other side. Like, black and Hispanic people have been underrepresented at these uh -huh. schools for decades, and they need somebody to look out for them. And in a situation in which they're overly underrepresented, like, if the Asian community, when they're the majority, is not considering them at all, and they see a proposal that helps them, I guess what I'm saying is why should they consider the Asian community's needs if there's been no concern or little concern on the Asian community side in regards to how they're underrepresented? When we look at, my point is, when we look at it from they're less than 1% and then the Asian community says to the proposal, what about Asians? I think black people say, you know. That, right, I, yeah. yeah, I get that. But I think... The important thing is for the mayor not to listen to Asians who are typically ignored, right? So beyond just the education arena, and I'm not saying the lawsuit is right or that the Asians should feel entitled to, to these seats because we shouldn't, and I certainly don't. But for the mayor to, to roll out proposals when we know that Asians as a people in New York City have some of the highest poverty rates and yet we receive very little funding or resources to address some of these needs. And I'm not talking about just education, but we're talking about housing and social services, right? And I'm not going into the oppression Olympics, but it doesn't help for the mayor to ignore what the Asian people are saying what he should have done is at least talk to the people to get a better understanding of what Asian communities look like in New York City. And he probably could have come up with some plan to actually create maybe a you know, Chinese high school directory that highlights some of the other schools that are not the specialized high schools and help these families because there are a lot of immigrant families who don't know how to navigate the system adequately right so why not create a support system and not just the Chinese families I'm talking about immigrant families more generally why not make a proposal at the same time to boost the support system for these families who have a hard time navigating the school system that may have actually done something you roll it out with supports for people who need it and then you can maybe talk about discovery program at a more rational level right now many in the asian communities whether they're right or wrong are feeling like yet again we don't exist we're not seeing nobody cares about us and that does not help the mayor's initiatives all i'm saying is that he needs to pay better attention to the constituents whose voices have been drowned or ignored historically, and I'm not saying those voices should come before the Black and Latinx community voices, but he still needs to be smarter about how to roll out these proposals. I agree with that. I, 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 if he doesn't consider all of his constituents, that's not okay. Um, and I don't, I, I don't say that anytime you have a proposal, you should just like not consider other people who could be affected mm -hmm. by it. The, the point I guess I'm getting at and, and why I reached out is that this is, I'm well aware that Asians and particularly black people, but also Hispanics, they do not have the best relationship, part, mostly because of the structure of this system, which includes public schools and people are always yeah. fighting for the public schools, why white people get all the private schools. Um, and 
I'm very aware of the dog whistles that are coming from some sides of the Asian community where it's not a matter of, you know, we're trying to have a meeting of the minds. It's a matter of why is there, it's not a matter of why are there so little black people um, uh-huh. you know, at these schools. It's a matter of why are there any black people in yeah. some of the, uh, some of my, and so when I know that there are a lot of, a significant portion of Asians who might have that mindset, um, I guess as somebody who's Hispanic and black, I, I'm very careful to have a conversation about this particular topic because I'm aware that some people on the other side of this conversation may not really, for lack of a better word, give a damn about black or Hispanic people. I agree with you. I completely agree. There is so much anti-blackness within the Asian community, particularly in the East Asian community, I find. Some of us who are who consider ourselves to be allies to Black and Latinx people are struggling to address this anti-blackness within our own people. And there is a world of difference, I'm finding, between those East Asians born in this country and those East Asians who immigrated to this country in the last three decades. A lot of them who came to this country in the last three decades or so they were escaping communism in China or other oppressive regimes in East Asian countries, except Japanese, we're the white people of Asia. Um, So they carry with them this need to escape this oppressive communist regime or dictatorial regime. They come to this country thinking this is a true democracy So they support values that, to me, are relatively conservative. And they don't have this history of discrimination that some of the people who were born and raised here carry with them. And unfortunately, many of them don't have the history of this country either. So there is the lack of understanding that this whole country was founded on genocide and enslavement of people. And Asian people were treated really poorly as well. And, you know, again, during the 60s, we were all fighting together. But many of the more recent immigrants don't understand this history. And they already come to the country with a healthy dose of anti-blackness because of global economy. Right? You don't have to be living in this country to get that anti-black message everywhere. Every time you watch a Hollywood movie or Hollywood TV show, it's everywhere. So some of us are really trying to figure out a way to start to dismantle that anti-blackness within our Asian community. And we haven't quite figured out what the best way to do that is, but we are having conversations about how problematic that narrative is. And we have to start aligning ourselves more solidly with other people of color. And I wanted to mention also as well that, you know, that this whole idea of Asians being ignored, it does, it is problematic in the sense that when you're underrepresented, like in politics or in the media, it's not talked about because everybody thinks that Asians are successful. They're overrepresented in certain schools. And it it looks like they don't need help. But in that regard, they do need help because they're underrepresented. But nobody discusses that. That's Um, right. Yeah. yeah. And but that's where the wedge comes from, though, right? I mean, this it's deliberate that we're portrayed that way. The U.S. government painted us as the model minorities back in the 50s and 60s. And a lot of people bought into that, including many of the Asians themselves bought into this model minority myth. So we have to start with our own dismantling of the model minority myth within ourselves to understand who we are, how we get into this how we fit into this racial hierarchy so that we can move forward with just extricating ourselves from this wedge position into the racial justice arena. No, that, that's, I was going to ask you at the bottom, I know it was a myth, but then you said it was, so I didn't It totally to, is. Yeah. To- it was fabricated. Right, and, and we... So the the Japanese and the Chinese Americans right after the World War II 
we kept our head down to rebuild our communities, especially the Japanese um, Americans. So we sort of bought into the whole thing, but the U.S. government definitely took advantage of that period and the recovery period for the Japanese Americans and Chinese Americans and propagated this model minority myth. But it is a myth. It was created to make us a wedge between the white power structure and the other people of color. There's no question about it. I, I agree 100%. I think it's being, that's exactly what the intention is right now. Um, yeah, but, yeah, exactly. But I, I, I don't have any more questions. I just want to say that um, this is a topic that um, it's hard for me to discuss with Nat without getting emotional because I see what's going on right now um, I kind of understand the history, and in my opinion, while you seem to be concerned genuinely about what's going on, I don't think that that represents the minority. I mean, the majority opinion, no. and no. Um, I get very ten to be honest. I get very tense about this because I kind of know what this is about. Um, so that that that's just to be blunt. But I yes. do to I, I, I do appreciate you talking to the other side, expressing your uh, opinions and um, having a constructive um, conversation about this. Um, well, right. thank you for the opportunity. Um, I, I, I do think people who think like I do are in the minority at the moment. But do know that I do have a network of East Asian and South Asian, education activists who share the same value. So we're not all, all monolithic racist Asians. <laughs> there are some of us who are actually real anti-racist people within the Asian community. So I hope we can actually have more conversations like this and build alliances.